Let's redo episode one of this podcast today. Here's the original intro. A novel about heavy-handed censorship in a dystopian future? According to the author, it's actually about people, quote, being turned into morons by TV. I guess that's dystopian, but readers have famously disagreed with the author about the theme of this book. Even so, it's a great read, and today I think I have an easy case to make for Ray Bradbury's iconic masterpiece, Fahrenheit 451. Welcome to A Case for Classics, the podcast where I try to talk you into reading, for fun, those works of literature that maybe you've come to associate with homework and book reports. They might exist on a master curriculum list somewhere, but that doesn't mean they aren't valuable as entertainment to the modern sensibility. Spring is almost here, and many of us will find ourselves in the mood for some cleaning and freshening up. I thought that with episode 100 coming very soon, that I'd revisit some of the earlier episodes of this show and bring them up to current standards, (laughs) which admittedly still aren't great, but you won't have to strain to hear what I'm saying. I considered just remastering the sound files and making them louder, but you know, those earlier episodes were still feeling things out and trying to find the rhythm that I'm currently bopping to when I write the show scripts. I've hit a sweet spot with the formula, and I decided to retool those episodes and make them the average 20 minutes I now aim for, as well as me sounding less shaky and terrified. When I'm done with these episode redos, I'll most likely delete those early episodes from the feed entirely. It's no big loss, but the books that I talk about are some of the most personally important works to me, so I want to make sure that they live on as episodes. I still have the scripts from these early episodes, which is a huge relief. I'll be pulling directly from them, and when I do these retools, it will be blissfully short work for me on that week. See, next week will be a new episode, making a case for a new work, but the week after that will be a retool, and I'll continue on like that until I feel like I've fixed those earlier episodes. Again, I understand, it's still not great, but I'm humoring myself here. Now, I usually begin these episodes with an introduction to the author and their life, but I didn't do that with Ray Bradbury in episode one. I thought about inserting it, but decided against it because I'll eventually be doing at least one more episode on Ray Bradbury and one of his works, and I'll do his little mini biography then. Now, with all of that gobbledygook out of the way, let's get started. This is a mostly unedited reading of the original script from episode one. I hope you enjoy it. Fahrenheit 451 was first published in 1953 and remains to this day a poignant criticism of censorship and the harm of replacing literature with anesthetized mass media. I won't be giving a beat-by-beat breakdown of the book because I want you to, you know, read it for yourself. So don't worry, no spoilers. I love the title of this book. It's so, so smart. This is a book where firemen start fires instead of extinguish them. And as such, temperature is an important consideration. This book is about the suppression by the government of ideas and feelings. Yes, feelings. Especially in the form of art and famously in the form of books. Now having said all of that, Do you care to venture a guess to the ignition temperature of paper? I'm talking the temperature at which, without being introduced directly to fire, paper will spontaneously burst into flames. That's right, smart people. It's 233 degrees Celsius. Or, to some of us over here in the New World, that's 451 degrees Fahrenheit. See what I mean? Amazing title. Three years after the book was first published, Ray Bradbury did an interview where he explained that he wrote the book because he was concerned about the threat of massive book burnings in the U.S. during the McCarthy era. Hitler burned books in the streets of Berlin, and that scared the bejabbers out of Bradbury. The image of burning books is prevalent in the text, and it's the enduring image that seems to stay with readers of Fahrenheit 451. However, Bradbury would later say that the book is a commentary on mass media killing any interest in literature. He gave those two different viewpoints, two very different reasons for the inspiration for this book. But I think over time, with the end of the meddling persecution of the McCarthy era, 
The threat of the book burnings moved a little more to the back of his mind, and the perceived threat of television rotting brains stood out more. That's just me guessing, FYI, but it's as good a theory as any. I found an anecdote on the internet that tells of an instance when Bradbury was giving a lecture to a college class about Fahrenheit 451. The students argued with him, the author of the book, that yes, the book was actually about censorship, and no matter what Bradbury said to the contrary, they were simply having none of it. Bradbury allegedly got so flustered that he stormed out of the class. I'll put a link to this little tale in the show notes over to caseforclassics.com. By the way, since I'm deleting the original episodes eventually, these retool episodes will have their own show notes, so yes, go check them out. Full disclosure, when I first read this book, I read it as being about censorship. It seems kind of obvious. But after reading what Bradbury had to say about the book, I have to admit that I can see his side. I see how his characters numbed themselves into uncaring, miserable creatures completely unbothered by things that are actually very bothersome, like impending war. They exist in a gray self-indulgence that is destructive. The main character, Guy Montag, is a fireman and starts to see things as they are, thanks to a non-conforming teen. Ah, the good old rebellious teens and their fresh perspectives. I love them, I really do. There are so many great stories in the world that include a teenager shaking things up. But his wife, Mildred, is what the dystopian government would consider an ideal citizen. She's numb, addicted, and wants no part of her husband's subversive acts. While I would argue that Mildred takes no joy in any part of her life, the closest she comes to enjoyment is watching shallow soap opera-like shows. And she watches those shows on these television screens that are the size of entire walls. Many of us would love to do our Netflix binging on massive screens like that, but <clears throat> that's bad. <laughs> At least in the world of Fahrenheit 451 it is. Today, people like Mildred might be recognized as being clinically depressed and would be encouraged to seek help for that affliction. But in Fahrenheit 451, this depressive state is encouraged by the ruling body. And that's terrifying. A state-sanctioned suffocation of one of humanity's greatest feelings and experiences, empathy, is reprehensible when considering not only what it would be like to live in such an era, but also in imagining how our species could go on in such a state. Bleak? Bleak is a freaking understatement. Now, don't go thinking that Ray Bradbury hated visual entertainment. When he was 14, his family moved to Los Angeles, and he used to sneak into theaters to watch the previews. He'd roller skate all over town, hoping to encounter the glamorous movie stars that he'd seen on the screen. He loved it. I think Bradbury feared that we would develop an addiction to the subdued life experience of living vicariously through pictures on a screen, especially the home television. You see, going to the movies is a sort of social experience. You leave the house, you can do a bit of people watching in the lobby and during the previews, and you are experiencing the world. Not so much with the home television. Today, the home theater is a mainstay in the American home. More often than not, we even have televisions in more than one room of the house. It is a reality that Bradbury didn't want. Luckily for us, he didn't predict, predict social media and the way we can communicate via groups or hashtags about what we're watching. The world has changed in a way even a science fiction writer of Ray Bradbury's caliber couldn't predict. Personally, on this topic at least, I think we're okay. We have our screens of many sizes in many places and we lose ourselves in them, but we communicate, we empathize, and yes, we still read. Books still exist and human interaction still exists. There has always been and there will always be too much apathy in the world. Screens have little to do with that. But love still exists, and compassion still drives certain individuals to acts of immense kindness and love. We're not in Bradbury's hell yet. Hopefully not ever. 
Incidentally, he also later had similarly strong feelings about the internet, and he was disgusted at the thought of his books being offered in ebook format. Also, I feel I should point out that many of Bradbury's works were adapted for television shows. Alfred Hitchcock Presents and The Twilight Zone both featured some of his work, and he also had his own television anthology series titled The Ray Bradbury Theater, which had six seasons from 1985 to 1992. Maybe he softened up on the idea of television over time? I'll let you draw your own conclusions about that. Okay, I've blabbed a bit about the book, and I've blabbed a bit about the author. So how about I really make my case as to why I think a modern sensibility would appreciate this book? Hmm? As a reader, I'll try anything. I have my preferences, of course, but if someone tells me that I really should give something a try, I'll give it a go. Having said that, I've found over time that the sci-fi genre isn't exactly my favorite. Ray Bradbury is remembered mostly as a sci-fi author, and while I think that he had much more range than that title gives him credit for, Fahrenheit 451 certainly falls into the sci-fi genre. And you know what? I love the book. It evokes such a feeling of humanness by showing the contrast of the deadened citizens of that dystopian future. That the main character is willing to give up everything in order to feel something, to truly experience life, I think, is what makes life so grand. Otherwise, life is a mere existence and not really worth the trouble, you know? I think one of the things that I really love about Ray Bradbury as a writer is that he was a Proustian man, nostalgic and sentimental. Yeah, it played out as a grumpy old guy not willing to roll with the changes after a certain age, but he had a fondness for the simple pleasures in life, and he valued the human imagination as one of the greatest treasures in the universe. Did you know that he didn't go to college? That brilliant man was self-taught, and you know how he learned, don't you? Books. The Silent Damsel in Distress of Fahrenheit 451. Precious knowledge, precious experience is to be found in the fine pages of a book. And Ray believed that more than anybody. In our busy world of slogging to work and making sure that we use what little spare time we have getting out and seeing the world, we forget of the worlds housed in the tomes so readily available to us that are easy to take for granted and forget. The thrill of being alive and experiencing the beauty of art and humanity is the aim of Guy Montag, but it is something that can be felt by the voyeurs reading his tale as well. In the movie Conan the Barbarian, a big question is put before a party of men. What is best in life? Do you know what I think it is? Especially when thinking of Fahrenheit 451. Feeling alive, awake, and aware. Numbness can be welcome, but only in short bursts to dull the pain of the stresses of life. Those pains come with the ecstasies, and both are necessary in order to revel in life. Life, not just existence. Now, I am trying to talk you into picking up this book and reading it, or getting it on audiobook and listening to it, but I don't think I'd be very thorough if I didn't bring up the movies. Movies based on books that I love are almost always a sore spot for me. Hey, I am a reader. I'm allowed to get mad about my stories getting changed. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> but maybe you're not like me, and you are pleased with cinematic versions of books. Okay, this is for you, even though I can assure you that I am making stink face as I do this section. A Fahrenheit 451 movie was made in 1966 and another in 2018. Reviews are always mixed, and these two are no exception. I admit, I've never seen them, for the very reason I gave earlier. I'm saving myself a grumpy headache. A movie that I have seen, that is more of a loose adaptation of a film, is titled Equilibrium. Made in 2002 and starring Christian Bale, it's a weird movie. As most movies of the late 90s and early aughts tended to be, but not in a bad way. The spirit of the book is briefly captured in this movie. It goes a little off the rails, but I have to admit, I like it. Maybe if you're the movie type, give it a try. 
I'll put links in the show notes so you can have a look at the cast and decide for yourself if you want to watch them. In summation, this is a book about a bleak future full of suppression and control, lightened by refreshing nonconformity and book hoarding, not to mention flamethrowers and enormous flat screen TVs. Okay, so it's not a happy book, not even a little bit, but it is an amazing read. And as I stated in the beginning, I think I had an easy case to make this week. I'd like to end this inaugural episode of my podcast with a quote from Ray Bradbury that inspires me personally, especially when it came to making the final decision to start doing this, per the esteemed Mr. Bradbury. You don't have to burn books to destroy a culture, just get people to stop reading them. That quote is the rallying cry for me in this podcast. Here's a little tidbit about me. I'm a writer. Yep. I'm a published author with a couple of books under my belt so far. And can I tell you, it is a tough gig. (laughs) In my day-to-day life, it horrifies me how many people tell me, sometimes with pride, that they never read. I know our time is limited and the realities of everyday life get us down. I'm susceptible to all of that too. What I'm suggesting is a chapter a day. Pick up a book that looks interesting and give it a go. One chapter a day. If you get sucked into the story, read past the one chapter. If, after a few chapters, you're not liking the book, quit and try another. There are lots out there. You'll never run out. In this show, I'm going to try to talk you into picking up works that, although classics, I believe they still have value to the modern mentality. They can still be profound, make you think, and most importantly, they can still entertain you. Art is subjective, and not every book will land with every listener. I know some works will be an uphill battle for me when I'm making my case, but I can't. We can't. Let those precious words fade. Okay, that's the end of the original episode one on Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit 451. (laughs) I won't make assumptions that you read this book in school because I actually started this podcast with this very work because I had a friend who admitted that they had never read it, had never been assigned to read it while in school. If you're in the same boat and you haven't read Fahrenheit 451, I urge you to give it a try because it really is a great book and I find myself in these strange days we're living through thinking often of that tale and how there are some very uncomfortable parallels between art and life. So give it a read and then come talk to me about it. Seriously, I know I'm not supposed to be seduced by those big TVs in the book, but I totally am. I admit it. And that's the case for this week. I hope I inspired you to pick up a new book. If you'd like to hear more from me, I co-host a horror-related podcast called The Ghost Writers Podcast with authors Mary San Giovanni and Matt Wildeson. Find me on social media. The show has a Facebook page and a Twitter account. Just search for A Case for Classics. Do you have something nice to say? Get in touch. Acaseforclassics.com is the best place for that. I have no options for you if you have mean things to say. Just please don't. Would you like to advertise on this podcast? Authors, I'm talking to you. Contact me about promoting your newest work, and I'll give you a good deal. Let's get the word out on all those wonderful works. If you enjoyed this show, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or any other streaming service you use. It would really help the show, and we can talk big books to a bigger audience. A Case for Classics is written, narrated, and edited by me, Summer Cannon. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for a new case next week.